Um, I just, uh, during the break, I asked uh, um, Lillian, how is everything going? Is it too fast or is it too slow? Is it too general? Is it too specific? And uh, one comment she said is that many teachers aren't teaching PhD students. Uh, let me just clarify. I'm using um, PhD student examples here for, for one of the classes I teach, but actually I also teach third year undergraduate classes and in this those classes we also teach students how to write research papers uh, of course they're they're going to spend more time to get to writing a research paper but ultimately that's their academic writing goal so they're wanting to write some research paper in the future so the goal is different it is similar even though they're a little further away from actually achieving that goal i'm using a very clear example of research paper writing simply as an example of some target writing that the students need to achieve. In a business writing context, you could easily consider that to be an email to a client or an email to a customer, for example. Uh, it's some clear writing goal that you can kind of put down and look at and analyze and understand the language of, um, rather than some kind of vague goal like um, improve improve their writing. I mean, that's so vague. In, uh, how, how can they even understand that concept, improve their writing? What writing? You know, what are they going to write and how can they improve that? Okay. And of course, by focusing on a specific writing goal, then it becomes easier to kind of develop all kinds of writing skills at the same time. So don't think this seminar is only about PhD journal paper writing. I hope that the concepts I'm introducing here are much more general. And in the next section, I'll try and illustrate some of these general concepts as well. Okay, so let's push on. Um, if you do have any questions though, please put them in the comments. And um, if I don't see them, then Lillian I'm sure will, and she can help there. Okay, I'm gonna share my, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna share my screen again. And let's go to, kind of part two of session one. And this is looking at the materials, tools, and methods for identifying writing objectives. Okay, so as I said before, we're often in a, pro a difficult situation that we don't know what the writing objectives of the students are because we're not from their field and we don't normally write what they are writing or have to write in the future. For example, how many business email letters, how many business emails have you ever written? How many nurse case reports have you written? How many legal documents have you written? How many physics research papers have you written? Probably not for many of us. So it's really important to get an understanding of what the students need to do. So how can we identify writing objectives? And the first and obvious way is to look at the published work on these topics. So of course, there are textbooks on you know, how to write. For, for example, the John Swales and Christine Feek book, really famous academic writing for graduate students. Look at that and you'll learn a lot about what, what the final writing objectives of students are. You can look at journals that focus on these topics like English for specific purposes, English for academic purposes, system. There's an IEEE journal called and Transactions on Professional Communication that looks at industry writing. Really, really interesting stuff. If you are not reading the literature, you really should start because they you'll get a lot of ideas from these different sources. And of course there's, um, conferences like TESOL conferences and the Corpus conferences, TALC. Uh, there's also websites like, uh, sorry, Facebook groups like the English Specific Purposes group in Facebook. And there's just websites like the Purdue University Online Writing Lab that has lots of information for students on how to write well. Very quite general information, but it's all good stuff. So don't just kind of look into your own head about what is good writing. Uh, especially in the disciplines of the students, go off and kind of look at some of these resources. But you'll see that all of these are kind of general. They're all like general academic English, for, you know, English for academic purposes, very general. If you are going to the level of having to teach a mechanical engineering student or a physics student or a business student, you kind of need to go beyond that. So one thing is Giphy. G G G G G <laughs> Google, or basically any search engine, is your friend. You can search on Google and find all kinds of good information. 
example papers, example reports, example materials that you can use as to understand what the field is. Uh, basically, anything's on the internet now. Um, you can also ask the students to submit their own writing samples to the class. And this is what I've asked you to do today, is also kind of get some materials from the students. What do the students have to write? I don't mean here that the students submit their own like essays from English classes. I mean, they submit things that they've written in their field or that they've got from their supervisors or from their senior students in the lab, actual samples that they want to write Okay, so as I say here, it could be previous reports, but more like discipline specific lab reports, discipline specific course writing assignments, their graduate thesis, maybe if they published a paper. So they bring to you what they want to do. And that can be a hugely in informative source of materials for your own course creation. And of course, I don't do this anymore because I've had students submit these every year for 20 years. So I, I have a very good idea now of what these fields are like. But if you're starting out and you don't know what physics papers look like or business letters look like, get some examples. And um, so these are their own writing, but you can also ask students to submit target writing samples to class as well, like journal publications, some conference proceedings and things. Things like this, as I showed you before get them to bring a target journal to the class and have a look at what it's like. What is the language like in these things? So if you are teaching journal writing, or it, even at the beginner level, even if you're at the English for academic purposes level, you need to see the final goal. So this is kind of what you want, as you can see on the screen here. Okay, I am sharing. Yeah, good, good, good. So you need to see something like this because just looking at one example can give you all kinds of insights into what this field looks like and how the writing works. Look at the title here, Experimental Analysis of Influences of Harmonic Voltage in High Voltage Network uh, on Harmonic Current in Distribution Systems. Well, there's a mistake in, in network. It should be networks of course, because the student, this is a student paper. So he's got problems with his singular plural nouns, but you can get a feel of, oh, this is like, okay, I now know what this is like. And then you can look at this language and think of language goals for the class. Think about structure and, and logical structures and stylistic issues and so on. So that's where I would really recommend you start with getting some samples from students. Just a moment, let me just check something, okay. Now, one thing that you can do is, is start yourself to do use some kind of corpus methods, not for the students, but just for yourself. So one tool I, I can, I'm going to quickly demonstrate in a moment, one tool I've created is called Ant File Converter, and it converts PDF files and Word files into plain text that allows you to then analyze the language with a corpus software tool like Ant Conc or Wordsmith tools. So you could you could convert full journal papers that the students give you or their assignments from other classes. And you get all these files, you put them into this program, you click start, and then you create a data set of student writing or professional writing. Now I've got another tool called Ant Core Gen that automates this process even further. And it's basically a one click approach to downloading every section of a research paper in a very specific discipline. It could be chemistry or biology or physics or social science. So it's an automated discipline specific corpus creation tool. It sounds crazy, but I'll demonstrate it in a moment. It looks like this. Um, I'll, I'll skip how to actually use it right now. I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate it in a moment. But once you've created this data set, it would look something like this. So you have a folder that's automatically created and it would have things like abstract, uh, the conclusion section, the introduction, the materials, the results, the title, all the journal papers are stored here in separate folders. And you can open these and see the text of the title, abstract, introduction, methods, results, and so on. 
And then you could load that into a, a tool like AntConc, which is a corpus analysis tool, and then use that to look at the language and see what exactly is going on. Okay, so I'm just gonna very quickly demo these now, and I'll show you, it can be done in like five minutes to, to be able to look and analyze this writing. So I'm just gonna escape from my presentation for a moment. Let's move that down here. Let's move those across there because you don't want to see those. That's something completely different. Just a second. Just a second. Let's move those across. You don't need to see them. Okay. So let's let's go to um, a quick demo. Okay. So you should be able to see here a folder. And what I have here is this ant file converter tool. And also in this folder is some research papers from a, from a student. Some a students brought these papers to the class and say, these are the journal papers that I want to write in the future. This could also be journal papers supplied by the department or things that you found yourself. Okay. This could also be student reports. Of course, this could be P, uh, word files from a student. Okay. Or from a set of students. Okay. So you just need to start the tool like this. Hopefully this will be good. On Zoom, software tends to run a little bit slower. Okay, so you can see here we've got the uh, tool on the right and the files on the left. And all you need to do is just basically drag and drop these in and start. And that's it. So the tool will go through and convert these files into text. I think you can see the text appearing here. You see that? quite simple right it's just really simple you just drag and drop these in and once they are finished let's just wait last one seems to be long what's happened to the light there we go okay finished okay so what we've done is we've gone from a paper research paper that looks like this yeah just a standard research paper very difficult to analyze because it's kind of got all this noise in it, like sections and stuff. And we've gone into a text file that looks like, just a second if I can show you here, that looks like this. So I'll turn that off. So it's, it's the same paper, but it's now in plain text format, no columns and everything is nice and clean. Okay, so why would we wanna do that? Because I'll, I'll close that software now. Because once we have this data in the form of plain text, we can then use AntConc, which is a, a, also freely downloadable from my website. We can now turn this, we can now load those files. You see that open file. I'm just gonna go to the folder that I just created um, here, go to my files and load in those journal papers. And now let's hide that for a second. So now we have the, um, the research papers in this software tool. And of course I can look at the papers the same way as before. Oh, it's kind of interesting, okay. But what I can now do is, for example, I can find all the words in these papers and see which words are the most frequent, for example. And you can see here the of and in, kind of boring, but then cells is there. And of course, this is a biochemistry uh, set of papers. So I can now look at how cells are used in this paper and we can see cells and, okay, cell, cell, cells, okay, cells compared to, and we can start looking at patterns in the writing. You'll notice, of course, that there's a word were. Why is it, why is the word were there? Ah, oh, this is methods. Okay, we were able to, we acquired, we added, we, we're uh, sorry, were added, were affected, were agitated, were analyzed, were calculated. So past passive forms with a strong verb like conducted and considered and so on. And then we can use the cluster tool, one other tool, to see what kind of clusters go with were. And then we have were treated, were used, were performed. And the most frequent cluster is were treated. 
which is kind of interesting. Oh, okay, we're treated. How do you use we're treated? And we can go back and click on that. And now we can see we're treated for, we're treated with. Okay, oh, there's this we're treated with. That's the only pattern basically that we have here. So if A were treated with B, cells were treated with some kind of um, product. Cells were treated with palingo juice. Cells were treated with recombinant L asparaginase from Z. Okay, great. Like that. Okay. So you can see I've gone from a, a journal paper, this is coming back here. I've gone from these kind of journal papers, which look like, oh no, how am I going to understand anything in this, to kind of interesting language features by creating a data set and then searching in the data set for different aspects of language. And we'll do this a little bit later. But of course, maybe you don't have students yet who can bring these kinds of papers to the classroom. So what do you do in those situations? As I said, we also have this AntCoreGen program. I'll show you this. So AntCoreGen is a bit like Ant File Converter, which you just start. You have to wait about 10 seconds for this to, to get running. Let's see. Come on. Okay, here we are. Okay, so you can see now this is the um, this is the tool, and it accesses an online database of of multiple disciplines, multiple disciplines. So you can see biology, computer science, ecology, engineering, people and places, social sciences, and all kinds of different fields. So how do we, and then we can download the research papers from this database and use that to inform your academic writing classes or directly use them in very discipline specific classes. So for example, let's let's just do this quickly. So first you need to choose a folder. So I'm going to create a folder here called um, demo. Well, let's put Hong Kong demo like this. It's just an empty folder and I'm going to create that. Yep, so you can see here, it's just an empty folder. Lillian, can you pick a category for me? Uh about earth sciences? Earth science, okay. There's 24,000 okay. journal papers here. Which field, subfield? Geology, chem, geochemistry? Geo... Okay. <laughs> <laughs> geography, maybe geography. Ge geography, okay. Geography, okay. Do you want cartography or <laughs> historical <laughs> geography? <laughs> historical geography, okay. Okay, there's 40 papers in there. Let's choose them all, okay? So we choose them all. And then, do you want the title? Abstract, introduction, uh, yeah, methods, okay. results, conclusion. Can we get everything. Or? Yeah, let's get. Uh, do we yeah. need the references, the body? We even body. get the PDF file, but let's just do these, okay? Okay. And then we click create, and that's it. Oh, you can see on the left now it's already oh finished. Thank you. Done. That was it. So on the left now, you can see an abstract, the conclusions, an ID for the actual paper. So you can go back to the database and find it online. Introduction, methods, results, title. So if you now go to here, you can see all the titles. Every title of every paper is nicely stored in a separate file like this. Why is that good? Because then we can go back to AntCong. I'm gonna close those other files. I'm going to now load these files. So again, Lillian, do you want to, what do you want to analyze now? Do you want to analyze the titles, abstract, introductions? How about abstract? Okay, let's go to the abstract. Let's load in all of them. There's 40. And again, we can generate the word list. And now we get the most frequent words from the abstracts. And it's actually a little bit boring because it's the, of, and, in again. But we also have were. So let's check this past passive form again. And look, we actually have a similar set of language, language verbs here, yeah? past passive forms. But if we do the cluster analysis now, we'll see that we don't get were treated, which was the most frequent in biochemistry. We have were found, were used, were conducted, because of course, this is a different field, yeah? 
So we're used, and not so many examples here, but used to and so on. So the idea of this is not just to analyze just this word, the word were, but you can use this now as a data source to answer questions from students. You can use this to inform your own understanding of research paper writing, title writing, methods, formal style, things like that. For example, you can now very quickly go to this tool, the concordance tool, and type the word but, and oh, there's loads of buts in this field of geography. There's lots of examples of people using the word but but it's always in the middle of the sentence. Can you see that? It's never at the beginning of a sentence. If we search for the word however, we might find it at the beginning. Oops, wrong spelling wrong. Like that. Oh, we've still got the wrong spelling. There, however. Now, if you type the word however, we get it at the beginning of the sentence and only once in the middle. So you can start telling students or helping students to understand the difference between however and but. But is often used in academic writing in the middle of sentences, but however is almost always used at the beginning of sentences to create a formal feel to the writing. Things like that. Yeah. Okay. So that was a very quick demo of, of these tools. I hope you followed all of that. There is a question asking if all the concordances are taken yeah. from student papers. So how can we be sure that the users are always appropriate? Well, that's great. So I have, I, I just demonstrated here professional writing. So the students brought PDF files of professional writing that they were given by their supervisor, for example, or, you know, some course writing that they had to read, some course readings. So that was professional writing and CoreGen also downloads uh, papers from professional journal, a professional journal. So what you could do is compare the professional writing and then look at the student writing and see if there's differences across them. So maybe the students are using but at the beginning of sentences, but in the professional writing, there are no examples of that. So then you could show the students, look in your field, you look at how however it appears at the beginning and in your writing, it always has but at the beginning. So the style is the problem here. Things like that. So I would use both. I think you can use both quite effectively. And actually the le next demo, to see if I can get to it. The next demo is actually just about this. One final tool I'll talk about in this session is uh, Protant. It sounds like some medical treatment, but it's not. It's a freeware automatic text prototype detection tool. What it allows you to do is load in files and find which of these files have the feature that you're interested in, have the most of the features that you're interested in. So you can load in some target writing and load in some target words. It could be keywords from the field, or it could be general words or academic words, and then rank each text in the, in the set by the number of these words it contains, and then look at and then closely read the text that come out as the result of this. I think it's easier to demonstrate what I'm talking about here than to try to explain it. So let me just demonstrate this. With a really obvious, a really, a very clear example of when you might want to use this tool. Let me just um, escape that for a second. Okay, so I have here um, uh, 17, uh, sorry, let me go back. Uh, oh, oh, I've already converted them, sorry. So I had 17 student papers, student reports in Word file, in a Word file format, and I converted them to text, as you can see here, using the Ant File Converter tool. So these are student writing. This is a student paper, okay? It's an abstract from a student, from a student, okay? Just, just simple abstracts, yeah, that I converted from Word. Now I can use, I'm going to compare this to the academic word list, which is, I hope you all know, this is a very famous list of, of academic words provided by Avril Coxhead in 2000. So I want to see which of these students are using the academic words well, and which students are not using the words well. So I could go through each of these papers and try and find academic words, but it's really difficult to do that but we can use this tool called Protant to do this automatically. So let me show you, I'm just gonna start it. 
again, you, you can download this really simple. Okay, let's just move that over here. <coughs> okay, so first I just add the files. Okay, that's straightforward. I just load in those student files. So we have 20 files here. Let me make that a little bigger like that. Okay. And then we need to add a reference. Now it could be a reference corpus, a whole data set, or it could be some list. So I'm going to add the list of academic words like this. That's it. Okay. So we have the student papers and we have the, the academic word list. And all we do is click start. And what it's going to do is it's going to go through all the papers and rank them by how many academic words they contain. And we also have a list of each, we can see each file, like file 17 looks like the best here. And we can see all the academic words that the student used in their writing. The second best is number eight, and we can see all the academic words that they used. And of course we can go down and look at, for example, number 16 only used three academic words in their writing and number 16 only used four. What we can also do is actually click on these files and actually see which is the best. So this is supposedly the best in terms of academic writing, but we can also go down and see the worst. And this is the worst. Uh, I won't go into detail about why this is the worst, but it allows you as a teacher to look at the students writing and identify what words they're using and maybe use these as examples in the classroom. You could say, here's a good example of academic words and here is a poor example taking away the name of course i can actually show you this directly now let me just demonstrate this properly so here is what is supposedly the best writing in that sample this paper here has lots of academic words in it there are some problems but you can see like significant investigate reaction uh there's some problems here as well because effect and so on. So this is supposedly has lots of academic words in it. So vocabulary wise, it's not bad, but there are some problems like it is, is not good writing and um, uh, look like simple is very poor writing. But we can also look at the worst example or, or the second worst example here. And one student wrote this. Nowadays, I am writing international conference report. My results that I thought they are enough have been obtained. I showed that results to my teacher. However, academic writing, my teacher asked me asked to improve my results in order to accept that paper. And you can see that this student is not using an academic writing style at all, except just a couple of words like however consulted. But then I made a new programming for the new method. So this Proton tool, this allows you to very quickly look at lots of different writing samples and identify good examples and weak examples. This could be professional writing, but it could also be student writing. And I hope you can kind of see the where this might be useful. Okay. Last tool, last couple of tools to show you here. Oh yeah, a question? There is, yeah, a question about, are there any existing disciplinary specific copra that we can refer to to save some time in creating our own? Great question, but I've just answered that a second ago. So the ant core gen tool, as I just said a few seconds ago, is can automatically create a very discipline specific corpus for you directly. So as Lillian demonstrated, she chose geography, historical geography, and created a 40 article corpus from that in a couple of seconds. So that's what I would recommend you use. Something like AntCoreGen to create a very discipline specific corpus that then the students can use in class. So they could create their own, which is what I actually have them do. I go to the class, I introduce the software tool, and for the homework, I say, go home, Go to the interface, choose your discipline, download 100 papers, and um, check out what the most frequent words are. Things like that. Is that okay, Lydia? Yeah? Yeah. Um, yes, I think so. Yeah. So I would, there, there are some quite g big general corpora, but there's not many very specific ones. And I think AntCoreGen is a good 
possibility to create your own in any field using that method. Okay, let me just talk about two more quick tools. So from a student's perspective, you know, downloading software like this and analyzing it can be difficult. But we also have like online tools like Antiquick Tools. I, I created this in this year. And this is a very simple profiling tool so that a student could copy and paste their own uh, writing into this tool. And then it will automatically highlight all the academic words that they are using. So for, th for them, this would be maybe much easier to use, right? They just copy and paste their text into the, into the program. They can check their own use of academic words and see if they're using them. Um, at least are they using them or not? And one last tool, Sketch Engine is another interesting tool that allows students to analyze words. Uh, they can type in a word and th the tool will show similar words like look, observe, see, but also these sketches we show them how the word look is used as a with when it's used as a subject or as an oh, sorry with a subject or with an object with a, as a phrasal verb for example so look around look down look upon look up so they can very quickly see how these words are being used and also what words could be similar to these words if they're wanting to pick a more academic word instead of look they could find the word observe, for example. So I think this kind of profiling tool can help them to quickly analyze their own writing. But of course, you could use that as a teacher to also check students' writing. But if you're going to do that with a whole class of students, and quick tools will be too slow, copy and pasting, copy and pasting. So the, and the uh, ProTemp tool will do that much, much, much quicker. OK, um, so that's a quick overview of the kind of tools that I would use to kind of get an understanding of the language of the field. Now, of course, I'm going to apply my own knowledge of English on top of that. So I get the data and then I look at common writing aspects. And these, of course, are audience, purpose, organization, flow, style, presentation. I'm going to look at the writing of biochemistry or geography and consider, okay, who is the audience here? How, what is the style like? How are, how are sentences linked together? What tenses are being used? What, uh, what verbs are being used? And so on. What about noun phrases? What's the title structure? And so on. So I'm going to bring my knowledge of English to that subject and analyze the writing of the subject and become much more knowledgeable about it. So just now, we now know that in geography, <laughs> however, is the most common word to, uh, uh, at the beginning of a sentence to illustrate contrast, whereas but comes in the middle of a sentence. So if a student comes and now asks us in, about geography, we can say something about the writing. And that's the idea but applied to style, verb use, tense, passive voice, active voice, any of these aspects. Okay, so let me give you now, I'm gonna, we've got, I've got 30 minutes before I want to go to the next part, or like 20 minutes maybe. So I wanna just quickly show you uh, over the next few minutes, how I would go about teaching and managing a discipline specific writing course. And I hope you can take part a little bit here as well. So these are kind of case studies to show the, the approach that I, I would recommend or I hope you might want to try in your own classes. I'm still focusing on journal paper writing, but again, you can use these same approaches in, in all different areas. Okay, so let's start with how would I approach teaching the structure of research papers? And there's a hands-on task here, which I hope you can take part in as well. So, how do I teach the structure of research papers? I start by explaining that a research paper is a story of the research. I actually even go further back and I start with nature. And I talk about nature in the, 90, in the 1800s being a series of letters that um, scientists used to write to other scientists. It was really like, oh, I'm doing this. It's like email 
it would be like email today. <laughs> they would just be like sending in these letters to nature, discussing what they did in their labs. But this became much more formalized over time so that now when people report their research, it's in a very structured style. And this is what I say to my students. These are actually slides from my, from my classes. Okay, so the writing of research has become very formalized because everybody is busy and there's lots of research that they need to understand. So what we generally have now is a very formulaic structure. So we have a research paper like this. This is from mechanical engineering. And we start with the title, which explains the topic. And then we have the affiliation information, name, company, university. Then we have an abstract that kind of summarizes the aim of the research and the gap and the results. And then we have an introduction that focuses on the background to the research. And this is really the start of the main story, yeah? the background, the problem, the aims, the methods and the results, introducing the context. Then we get to the materials and methods. Uh, then we get to the results and the discussion. Then we might finish with some conclusion with the meaning of the research and the impact of the results. And then of course we have references explaining where this, you know, where the sources came from. And that's it. Yep. So very procedural. Yeah, very formalized. But I don't stop there because that would be a very teacher centric approach. So then what I do is I ask the students to look at their own research papers. I say, okay, so that's the basic structure, but what's it like in your field? Okay, so everybody get out your own example paper from your own field and let's have a look at that. Okay, so I would like you guys, everybody in the room, I'd like you to try this yourselves. So if you go to the uh, Google Drive, you should see, I'll show it on the screen here. You should be able to see um, task six. This is the structure analysis task. And you'll see here a PDF file, which is a wireless reactive power Tesla paper. Okay, it looks like this. It looks super technical, okay, don't worry. Don't worry. Can you get that? I hope you can all see that. You also see a little task um, explanation here. So you can see here what to do. What I'd like you to do is very simply, just maybe I can even demonstrate, show you here, um, is to skim the sections and identify the overall structure and note what the similarities and differences are to the model that I showed. Okay, that's it. I'll show it here on the big screen. Yep, so skim the sections, identify the overall structure, the main parts of the story, title, abstract, introduction, and then what similarities and differences do you find to the model that I just showed you? And then ideally you would look at a tag target journal in, of the student and again, identify similarities and differences. So I'm going to give you a minute or so. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to set a timer. I always have a clock in my class. So I'm going to give you one minute. That's all one minute. And you have to look through that test, that reactive power, very technical uh, paper and try and find this structure. Is it the same or is it different? Ready? Go. One minute. I'll show it on the screen here, just for people who, who didn't see it. There you go. <laughs> oh, 
time up, everybody. That was actually one minute, 30 seconds. A little bit longer. Uh, Lillian, did you finish? Still, still checking? Yes. Okay, I'll give, everybody, I'll give everybody one more minute. But remember, everybody, you're not reading the paper yet. You're not supposed to be reading it. You're supposed to be looking at the overall structure of the paper. Does it have a title? Does it have a name? Does it have an abstract? Does it have an introduction? Does it have a method section? Does it have results? Does it have discussion? And so on. Uh, Christina, thank you for your comment. <laughs> Christina Penarola, Penarola, thank you. How are you doing, Lorena? I can see you there in the video. Did you finish? Yeah, it's not, it should take about a minute. I think, yeah, it's just uh, straightforward, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, students, uh, that's it, everybody. Time up, everybody. I'm not going to give you any more time now. Now, this, this does, this, the reason for the clock and the one minute is it tells students that they're not supposed to be reading the paper. They're supposed to be looking at the ba very basic structure of type headings, headings in the sections. Okay, so Lorena, because you're on video and you can hear me and you're responding well. So does it have a title? Yes. It does, right? So wait, let me mm -hmm. get this animation going. Yeah, it has a title. Does it have a name and affiliation? Uh, yes, it does. Yeah, and does it have an abstract and in index uh, terms? Abstract, uh, introduction, well, I think, yeah, everything. Results, results. Ah, but no, 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 but it doesn't no. wipe. Look at materials and methods. Does it have materials and methods? Uh, I thought, was it the experimental setup? No, is ah, that the exactly. Yeah. So first, the introduction is there, but it also has a Tesla transmission section just after the introduction. You, mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yes. There's a section, section two is kind of like, is that an introduction or is that background? What I, is it? I thought maybe it's part of the background, no? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's part of the, yeah, it's, kind, it's kind of, it's part of the introduction, but it's kind of like, like previous work kind of idea, yeah? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the materials and methods section is there, but it's not called materials and methods, it's called experimental setup, yeah? Mm, true. And what about results and discussion? Did we get that? Uh, we did, it was, uh, let me double check. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, results. Uh, yeah, it says results from discussion. It's really one, uh, one section, so. Yes, yeah, so in yeah, some- merged together. Some journals, in some journals, they keep them separate, always separate, and in some journals, mm -hmm. they combine them together. It's still mm -hmm. the basic structure. Conclusions, future work? Yes, yes conclusions were there. No, no, because there's no future no? work. It, it only <laughs> says conclusion. Well, it did say conclusion, but you would expect it to be there as well, wouldn't you? Like normally you would, in conclusion. But if yeah. you look, look at the final, if you look at the last sentence of the conclusion, we get future, future research. research will try to determine. Ah, so it's there, <laughs> but it's not in the header. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have this variation across the writing acknowledgements, but we only say acknowledgement mm -hmm. because there's only one person to say thank you to, and then references are there. That's true. So the idea of this, thank you, Lorena. Great. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> so everybody now, for everybody, the idea of this is that you introduce the idea that we have a basic story, but then we have variation depending on the discipline. The basic structure is the same, but we have results and discussion. We have Tesla transmission in the middle somewhere. Now, if you guys, unfortunately, we probably don't have time now for this, but if you guys bring now one of your students' papers from biochemistry or, bi or business or something else, you will find something like the same story, but there will be some differences. And it's good for the students to see what is core and what variation is possible. For example, in, in chemistry, the materials and methods section comes at the end. After we have introduction, results, <laughs> discussion, and then materials and methods. It's crazy, but it happens all the time in that area. In some fields, they have it in a completely separate paper called supplementary information 
online somewhere else, things like that. Many, many um, disciplines don't have, um, after the introduction, they would have like previous work, like the Tesla transmission example. So you as a teacher should be aware of this variation, but instead of trying to know it all yourself, which is impossible, don't you try and learn everything, ask the students to find it themselves. They bring in their target field, they look at this basic model, and then they identify variation. Okay, so let's keep going. So my student homework in the class, I would then have some homework, which is find a journal that you would like to publish your research in, find a research paper in that journal that matches your interests, look at the paper and which sections are the same as this Tesla reactive power same section journal, which sections are different and what conclusions can you make about the structure of research papers in your field? See that? So don't finish with just your model of writing, let them go away and find out what similarities and what differences there are. And then I actually have them complete a survey and then they tell me what journal they want to target and what is the title of an interesting paper and they send me the URL of that paper and then I create my data set from their samples. So then I can go into the next class and I know exactly the kind of journal paper they want to write. I know I have an example of every student modeling what I want them to, what I, I need to teach. So then I can talk about their writing goals instead of what I think is good. Okay, so let's go to case study two. Okay, how would I go about teaching research paper titles then? Same problem. We have many disciplines, we have lots of variation. So what can we do with the titles? So again, I start with a bigger picture. So when you're writing anything, whether it's for science or engineering or business, we need to have a consideration of who is reading it. Who is the audience? What is the purpose of the writing? What is it trying to do? How is it organized? What's the structure of the writing? Then we have, how are the ideas linked together in flow? What is the style? Is it formal? Is it informal? What kind of stylistic features are there? How is it presented on the screen or in the, in the publication? You know, literally presentation, font size, font color, bold, italic, and so on. So I start with my explanation of titles like that. And then I can very quickly summarize some of the main points of title writing. This is ge very general, right? So the audience of research paper titles are students and scholars and professionals. They are scientists and engineers often who might not be experts in the area that you are doing the research in. The purpose is to inform the reader about the main points of the research and persuade the audience to read the paper. So it's not just giving information, it's got persuasive elements. And we have three different ways to organize a title, phrase titles, hanging titles, and sentence titles. With a phrase title, we link together with prepositions. With hanging titles, we link together with colons. And with sentence titles, we link together with verbs. Very general now. This is not discipline specific. This is just general knowledge. Then we have style. We usually use a formal academic writing style and we can present the title with capitalization of only the first letter. Let me get my pointer again. Just the first letter of the title. Or we can have capitalization of all the first letters of nouns and adjectives and adverbs and conjunctions and so on. Or we can capitalize everything. And I tell this to my students, right? And then of course I give them some examples. These are examples of research on arthritis arthritis, you know, bone disease. And we can see a phrase title, A of B in C, a hanging title where we have the colon in the middle here. And we have a sentence title where we have the verb causes linking things together. Do you get that? Yeah. Phrase titles, hanging titles, sentence titles. There's no other way of writing a title. <laughs> this is it. There's only three ways. Okay. I don't know which style the students should use. I can just give some examples, yeah? 
Now, what do you need to put in the titles? Yeah, we have this title structure, but what do we put in it? Well, we can put the topic of the research and the scope of the research and the methods and the application and the name of some product that's created or a description of some algorithm or method or approach. We need to add the results of the research, what's novel, what's valuable, what's key in the research, yeah? So we hit these basic contents of the research. You will notice nothing is discipline specific yet. Nothing is discipline specific. It's just general knowledge about titles. Okay. And then we can go one step further and we can say, well, if you're writing a phrase title, then usually you're going to start with the topic, right? The topic of the research. And then you can talk about the application and the method and the scope. How do you link these together? Well, with things like for and with and to, topic for application, topic using a method, topic in some kind of scoped area. The novelty of, or the value of the research is usually modifying this topic or this method or this application. It's like a noun or an ing verb or a past participle or an adjective, like new topic in interesting with interesting application, things like that. Okay, with a hanging title, then we have the topic, then a colon, and then the type of research, the description, the application, and so on. Okay, and again, the novelty will be the modification of the topic or the application or so on. So very similar idea. And with a sentence, then we have the topic of the research causes or produces or generates, and then some kind of scope or application or method. This is just general kind of modeling. Now, of course, my background is discourse analysis. So I'm going to be um, I'm going to like this kind of way of seeing language, just very meta, yeah? And again, the novelty of the value will modify the subject or modify the verb or modify the object. Okay, and now we can get some examples, okay? So here, here's an example from the field, from whatever, this is physics. So can the students, can you, can we understand the structure of that title? Well, I'm going to ask you to do it in a moment, in a minute, everybody. But if you look at this, we can see, okay, we have kind of this noun phrase followed by for, followed by another noun phrase. So it's basically A for B. And if we have this A for B pattern, well, we know that A should be something like the topic and B should be the application. Yeah, so it's some topic with some application compression of antiproton clouds, this method to compress these proton clouds, and we're going to use that for anti-hydrogen trapping. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Notice the compression of is actually the novel feature of the research. Compression is the interesting part here. That's the novelty of the research, the novelty of compressing clouds for some interesting application. We can do the same here. Single particle tunneling in strongly driven double well potentials. Whoa, what's that? Okay, um, Clive Lee, I can see you there on video. So what's this in terms of structure? Oh, uh, it's an alert. I guess it's, it's, it's fairly similar, isn't it? Well, um, look at the, remember the topic, is it, is it topic? What is it? Method? What is it? Single puddle tunneling, what's that? that, that, that that's, a, that's a kind of a method, isn't it? In? in, in and, and then you've got the kind of the, the application of it. But, it. but in doesn't go with application, right? In goes with scope, right? I'm not, I'm not sure, actually. Oh, well, um, well, that's what we, when we came back just before I was talking about this, right? So yeah, yeah. topic for application, topic using method, topic in, on, at, scope. Mm -hmm. So coming back here, we would have, what would you say then? Method in application? That doesn't make sense, right? No, no. Hmm. 
this is exactly what I get students to do, by the way, everybody. <laughs> so when they're thinking about writing their titles, first, what is their topic? What is their method? What is their application? How will they put these things together? So Clive, can you give me a quick analysis then? What would you say? Uh, <laughs> it's not easy, right? It, it's really tough. So, uh, so you've got your single point kind of tunneling. Um, I'm guessing is, is this kind of, is a method? And, and um, this is where it's used. Is, is where it's used, yeah. Okay, kind of. Not quite right, because of course it is a method. Single puddle tunneling is not a method, but a phenomenon. And it's the phenomenon which is the topic of their research, right? Their, their oh, okay. research is focusing on single particle tunneling. So it's A in B, which would be topic in scope. Now, in scope, oh, okay. meaning tunneling in the context of strongly driven double well potentials. This tunneling happens everywhere, but in this research, they're focusing on tunneling in this particular place. Okay, don't worry too much about the content here. But the idea of topic is that doing their research is focused on this phenomenon and it's in the context of these double well potentials. Once we get that, then we can start looking at single particle tunneling is probably the novel feature, right? Single particle tunneling is interesting. It's not double particle, it's not multi-particle, it's single particle tunneling and strongly driven double wells is probably some novel aspect of this context. So it's an interesting tunneling phenomenon in an interesting context. Do you get that? So that's what I get students to do. So I have them looking at these general titles and then try to understand where these, these are coming and how it all works. Okay, so task for you guys. This, I want this in a breakout group. So I'm gonna have four of you together and you have to figure out the structure of these these four titles they're crazy complex okay <laughs> but don't worry about the content think about the structure okay is it topic for application is it topic in scope is it topic with method and whatever okay so i'm going to break you out into groups of four if you go to the google drive you can go to the task and it's right here i'll show it on screen um if you go back to its task just a second where are my tasks so it's task uh, uh, seven, okay? And you've got a nice worksheet here that lists up these four titles and you have to identify the structure, identify the key parts. Is it topic, method, results, application, scope? And then mark any words that mark some kind of novelty or some value, okay? I'm gonna give you about five minutes. So each of you has about one minute to kind of look at everything and then one minute each to kind of like try and analyze things and maybe talk about it. But it should be pretty quick if you get the fundamental idea of how these are linked to, these ideas are linked together. Okay, so I'm gonna break you out into groups. <laughs> now, let's hope everybody's back. Is everybody back? Most people, I think. Okay, so everybody, I hope you were able to spend five minutes together, like going, oh, this is so difficult. Because remember, as a teacher, I'm the teacher of this session, I didn't have to do the analysis at all, right? I just sat and waited for the students in the room to do the analysis on their own. As a teacher, I don't need to do the analysis. The students are doing the analysis of their own titles with the idea of topic application methods and so on. So there is no real correct answer here. What's important is that the students look at the titles, think about the kinds of relationships between the words and come up with a basic structure. And if that's too difficult, even simpler is, do they write with phrases or sentences or hanging? So, so everybody, what do you think then? Let's look at these titles. So number one, what do you think? Is this a, is this a phrase title, a sentence title, or a hanging title? <laughs> it's like, how do you answer to that? Um, phrase title, who picks its phrase title? Raise your hands. Phrase titles, yeah, everybody knows it's a phrase title, right? Because there's no colons and there's no verbs in there. What about number two? Is it phrase, sentence, or hanging? Who thinks it's a sentence? No, it's not a sentence because there's a colon in the middle there. Look, there's a big colon right there. It must be hanging. 
But then if you look at the, the sides of it, you'll notice that the actual parts of this are phrase titles, right? A using B as C, and then we have a colon, and then we have A and B. So it's a phrase, it's like two phrase titles combined with a colon. Number three, what's that? Who thinks it's a, a sentence title? Suzanne and Clive, congratulations. You're the only guys who got it right. Okay. Everybody else, did you not see the word mark? Mark is a verb. CD38 and CD157 ectose enzymes mark the cell substrates in the human Cornelia limbus. It's a sentence with mark as the verb. That's why it's really difficult for teachers. That's why it's better for students to do the analysis and explain the connections to the teacher. Okay? It's much more safer than you saying, oh, you can see this is a phrase title, and then go, they would say, what? That's not a phrase, it's a sentence, you idiot. Yeah, it's mark because enzo e ectoenzymes mark things. That's what they do. And these enzymes mark these, they flag, they color these cell subsets so that we can see what's happening. Last one, obviously it's a, a hanging title, but then we can think about the structure of the title. So what's this at the beginning? Is that a topic or is that a name or is that a description? It's obviously some kind of acronym, right? It's obviously some kind of thing. It's a name of something, ENROAC. And then we have the description of what that is as the rest of the title. And if you look at the description, it's A, 4, B, on, C, and D. So it's kind of this phrase again. So we can kind of analyze this. The students ideally do this analysis, yeah? So they, they see this A, 4, B pattern, yeah? And it's not just A, it's strong a for B. Now, is it topic for application? Well, maybe not. This support for something, it's not quite application, but maybe it's okay. What about this one? This is really easy because this is A using B as C. So that's clearly topic using method. And then we have some description afterwards. We don't, we don't just have cyclizations that we have diostereoselective nickel catalyzed reductive cyclizations. So that's a novel topic with a novel method that they're using there. And then the last one, of course, this would be some kind of, oh, sorry, here, A mark B. So this is a sentence, subject, verb, object, in scope. And then we have NROAC, which would be uh, this name and then description. But then we also have this kind of novelty of European networks. So that's some kind of novel topic for some application um, on some kind of scoping area here, some context here. So that's how I go about teaching titles. The, it, we come back to the same point again. I will present some kind of general model that I know from my general knowledge of writing like sentence titles and um, prepositional phrases and noun phrases and so on, and then present this, that to the students. They then go to their own journals and then they think about the structure of their titles and then they write. So the homework for the students would be list up the important information you want to include in your title. So what do you want to write in your title? The topic, the scope, the method, the applications, the novelty, the value, the names of things. Great. Then what are you going to use? Phrase, hanging, sentence. Go to the journal, pick the most popular one. Then follow the template and write, oops, sorry, and then write it. Yeah. So we have, oh, where does that go? Where's my, oh, sorry, that's it. Because I don't have, yeah, <laughs> they write it. And then I would look at their titles and evaluate how, meaningful it is. Wendy asked, how can we correct students putting too many ideas in just one title? I would ask Wendy a question. How many ideas can we put in a title? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Is it four? Is it 10? How many can we put? And of course, if we come all the way back to maybe come back here, these are real examples of, from real papers. So if I go back to my AntConc tool, I can look and see what kind of titles we have. 
and answer that question. So I would go back to the journal and see, you know, look for long titles and then see what kind of things are in there and, and then answer that question. I would not want to say one or two or three or four or five, but I know there can be at least five in some titles. In, in some chemistry and bioscience fields. So I don't want to put a number. I would ask the students to go and look and see how many things are in the title based on on, in, for, of, and, so, and things like that. Is that okay? Uh, Lorena, phrase and hanging. Ah, oh, you answered the questions. Great, thank you there. Okay, let's go on. This is the third case study, and then we'll we'll do some more hands-on stuff as well. Okay, so, and you have a bit of writing to do here as well, everybody. So, how would I teach materials and methods writing? I'm going to follow the same approach again. So, we look at the audience, purpose, organization, flow, style, and presentation, general knowledge about general writing, and then the students would apply that in their own field. Okay, so what are the features of materials and methods? Well, the audience of a, of a journal paper is usually quite narrow. It's not going to be a general reader who looks at the methods. It's people who want to replicate the study, repeat the study. They might look, but other people, they just want the results. The purpose is usually to summarize the method, not to, repli not to describe everything. Yeah, it's not a lab report, it's not everything. It's just the important novel methods, the special equipment and so on. How does it, how is it organized? Well, we start with the methods, materials, and then we go to the methods. We don't usually have linking phrases like first and second and third and next. We don't usually have them, but of course some fields might. And the style is often this past tense passive voice. But we can use present tense and passive voice as well. So we could have both. Yeah, present active, past active, past passive, past present passive. <laughs> They're all there. Things like avoiding numbers at the beginning of a sentence. We, want to, we don't want to put 10 at the beginning of a sentence. We want to kind of avoid numbers. We usually spell out numbers one to nine. We don't want to start writing numbers depending unless it's a unit of time or a unit of measure, things like that. And when we present it, we might call the section materials and methods. We might call it experimental section. We might call it experiments. We might position the section after the introduction, which is very common, but it could also come at the end of the paper after the results. Okay, I know this because I've looked at different fields, but I'm not going to say in geography do this because I'm not sure. I'm going to say these are the possibilities that we have for positioning. And then I'm going to give an example. Now, I pick examples from my students, right? This is what they want to write. So this is a top level journal, but it could be for third year undergraduate students, right? Don't think this is like PhD level. This is third year undergraduate level. I'm going to teach. I'm teaching third year undergraduate students, but this is a professional journal, top in the field top journal in the field. All the students would love to publish in this journal. It's the top in the field, Jax. So I'm gonna use this as my example. So here is a methods section. And as an English teacher, you're gonna go like, this is horrible. What am I gonna do with this? Yeah? The key point for all of this writing is to not focus on the content because we're not chemists. We're not chemists. We're not going to understand the content here. But what can we see here? Well, all scientific writing, all writing is subject, verb, object, right? Basically, subject, verb, passive voice, and whatever. So here is the subject. High performance liquid chromatography, HPLC. It's something, okay? It's a method. Yeah, some method. Then we have HRMS. Then we have NMR spectra, and then we have an EPR spectra. Okay, what's the verb? That's it, okay? So A was performed. So I have this idea of changing these long noun phrases into just A, it's something, yeah? Some method was performed. Something B were acquired, okay? And then we have C were recorded, D was performed, E were performed, F was performed. Okay, it's like dead easy. 
is simple English. A was performed, B were acquired, C were recorded, D was performed, E were, were obtained, F was performed. It's simple past tense passive voice, dead easy. Anybody can understand it, right? But what's, what else do we have? We have modification, crazy modification. A was performed using B with C with D. B were performed using C equipped with D or E with F or E with, and it just goes on and on and on. It's just modification like the title. Remember the title was A using B? That's what we got here. A using B with C for D in E to F, 4G and H and just going on and on. So we can simplify that to this. So that and that is the same. It's exactly the same method. So A was performed using B with C equipped with D, E were acquired using F equipped with G or H equipped with I, blah, 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 blah. Z were recorded, blah, 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 blah. simple. So what we need to focus on in the class, the students need to know what is the tense? Is it past or present? Here, past clearly passed. Is it active voice or passive voice? This is passive voice. Chemistry is usually passive voice, usually, almost always. Then they need to know how to modify these now, uh, well, sorry, what comes after the verb, yeah, was performed using, performed on, acquired using, recorded using, equipped with, obtained at. They have real trouble knowing which prepositions to use. Real problems with this. But with a corpus tool, like I showed earlier, it's simple. They just search for was performed and they get all the examples. They can do this on their own. It's really straightforward. Yep, so that's what I explain to the students about methods. Yep, so I can I give a bit more information like, so you need to explain how you use the materials using past voice or maybe passive voice. And if it's, if the, then explain the properties of the materials. So if the properties are determined by the experiment, we use past tense passive voice. But if the properties are intrinsic to the materials, then we switch to present tense and active voice. So like this, yeah. For the strength test, thin foils were cut. The surfaces were polished with sandpaper. It's literally just passive voice, yeah? But if we have some intrinsic property, then we switch to present tense. So we have stainless steel samples were prepared. These are commonly used materials. So this commonly used is not part of the experiment. It's just some general knowledge. So we switch to present tense. As a result, large amounts of oil are used. Again, it's not the experiment now, it's just general knowledge about this material. We can talk about uh, materials and methods with human agents. So when the human is doing the experiment, we, we, use, we hide the agent and we use passive voice. We make the materials and the equipment the subject and we use verbs in the present or past tense with passive voice. So we have like this. First, an aline was added. Then the mixture was heated. Finally, an alphamic isomer was obtained. So you'll notice I'm using examples from the field. I am using examples from the field, but I'm not understanding the content very much. I'm just using these examples because they're clearly subject, past, passive voice. And I can use this compact style where we get rid of the first and the then and just put it all in one sentence. An aline was added to an ester in the presence of a catalytic amount of reunion complex. The mixture was heated at 135 degrees for 12 hours, and an alphamic isomer was obtained in 91% yield. Classic writing, dead easy. A was added to B, C was heated at D, F was obtained. Yeah. And that's how I kind of teach this, yeah, with this idea of A and B and C and D. Same idea as before. Focus on the language. Don't worry about the content here. Looking at the patterns, the forms, the, the tense, the style, that's what we're looking at here. Okay, and then we can look at natural processes. And if you have a natural process, then the, the natural process is the subject. Uh, and then we use present tense or pa uh, past tense with active verbs. So most metals expand and contract. 
liquid water forms ice crystals, gases expand. You'll notice it's not passive voice now because it's a natural phenomenon. Gases expand, water forms ice crystals. So I explain that to the students as well. So we've got human people doing things. We've got natural things happening. Here's the basic model. Go away, look at your field, find out how to write. You know, what, what should you be doing in your journal? Is it present tense? Is it past tense? Is it active voice? Is it passive voice? And you'll find different journals have different ways to write this. Yeah. And there's another example in past tense there, evaporated, melted, grew. Okay, so quick writing task for you all. Okay, now this is, this is of course, you now are kind of like the students in my class. Okay, so in the class, I want to get them to understand how to go from a lab report into a, a more of a, write, a, a, a prose writing form. So they need to take this kind of sentence record aftershocks from the earthquake and turn it into a methods kind of style yeah so um just looking at this first sentence how would you convert that into a typical methods section writing sentence so let's ask um sissy can you i can see you there sissy Oh, you have to unmute. Okay, yeah. I unmute myself. So this is actually a research paper on earthquakes in Japan. And this is a, a seven step me method. But if you're a student in my class, I would say then, okay, so you need to f first focus on uh, the, wh what's the, what's the subject of this sentence then? What, what is what, what is this subject? Subject, yeah. Subject, so uh, need... aftershocks, is it? Yeah, great. So you start with aftershocks and then yeah. we need to aftershocks, use... Aftershocks uh, from the earthquake was yeah. recorded, oh, be careful, were recorded. It... Yeah, good. And okay, so five stations have... in the area. Well done. <laughs> okay. Great. That's my class. <laughs> but already you have to kind of manipulate this to what is the subject of the sentence? It's aftershocks from the earthquake. Then you need to think, okay, is it past tense or present tense? Well, let's use past tense. And then you have to be careful with the subject and verb agreement. Aftershocks were, not was, aftershocks from the earthquake were, then you have to change the record into a past participle, recorded. Aftershocks from the earthquake were recorded at five stations in the area. Great. And all the students can kind of get that idea, right? They still do one other, but Anson, I can see you next to here. Can you do number two? Oh. One station would be the subject. Yeah. Yes, one station would be the subject. Uh, one station uh, was in, installed on hard rock and the other stations were installed on soft ground. Very good. So now we have a complex thing because we've got two, two steps yes. here and we need to have the verb working twice. So one station was installed on hard rock and the other stations mm. were installed on soft ground. Mm other stations were installed so now you have mm. to get that verb pattern changing mm. and of course you could write this in a compact way and just say one station mm. was installed on hard rock and the others on soft ground mm. because the verb carries across to the second part you mm. don't actually need to repeat it but yeah great <laughs> really good okay so i'm just worried a bit about time but let's let's do a four minute task okay if you go again now to the tasks in um, Google Drive, you will find we have uh, the next task, which is to finish this writing task. Okay, so look at the, uh, where is it? RA methods, go to the RA methods. And here you, you'll see these four, these seven sentences. So everybody, imagine you're a student in my class you could be a chemist, you could be a biologist, you could be a mathematician, a business student, nursing, where basically anything. Edit these sentences, don't rewrite them, just edit them and try and create a uh, seven sentence methods, or you could com conflate four and five and six and seven into one sentence each, making this a six, five sentence into five sentence methods. Okay, again, maybe we could, uh, maybe just, maybe, we don't need to go into a breakout group here. It's more like individual writing. So I'll give you four minutes, everybody, stay in the room. 
but try and write, rewrite this section. I'll give you four minutes to do it. And if you have any questions while we're doing this writing, just please make it to unmute and just ask if you want. And as you, you can all see my screen here, so I'm gonna just edit the first one as we were just in, instructed. So aftershocks were recorded. Oh, aftershocks from the earthquake is probably better, right? Aftershocks from the earthquake, let's keep that together. Aftershocks from the earthquake were recorded at five stations in the area. And then we have um, one station was installed, ah, so it was installed on hard rock and the other stations, let's do it the, the, the clearer way, but maybe not the best way. And now we have, oh, now we need were installed on soft ground. Yes, done. Thank you, Anson and Sissy. <laughs> Got three minutes left, everyone. Uh, Brooke, Richard Armstrong, you've got your hand raised. Do you have a question or is it just that you just left it up there? Ah, I'm not sure. It has been a while. Oh, okay. Maybe, um, maybe bring his hand down. One minute left, everyone. As you're finishing off, let me just make a couple of comments about this, this task. So this could be really for any level of student, even first year undergraduate students, I think could easily handle this. The important points for designing this task was to have some real research but then also to pick uh, that the students might be interested in, but then edit that real research into a form that I can easily then present to the students um, with, without, with, without too much of the technical content involved. So it, these sentences are edited from the original. So it is a much simpler set of sentences now, but I think they highlight the feature that I want to focus on. But in the end, the students will actually have to go back and look at their own field to see what style they should be using in their own writing. Okay, that's four minutes, everyone. So how did you get on? Let's see. Um, so we have the first sentence, yeah? Aftershocks were recorded from the earthquake at five stations in the area. One station was installed on hard rock and the other stations were installed on soft ground. Um, I'm gonna put Lillian on the spot here. Lillian Wong, what about number three? I didn't, I didn't work on it, I was like... Well, you have to do it now, quickly. Each station? Uh, each station was fitted, right? Yeah, that's right. Each station was now, so fitted is not easy, right? As a past participle, each station was fitted with a velocity type seismograph. Continue. Data. Oh, continue. Okay. Uh, you mean four? Yeah. Uh, oh, Lorena, oh, great answer. Yeah. <laughs> Keep going, Lillian. Okay. 
uh, data were collected from each station? Interesting question here, because Lorena in the in the comments wrote data was collected. So is data a single, is it plural or single? And it really depends a little bit on the journal, but mm. often it's treated as plural. So it would be data were collected. Yeah, generally it's plural, but it's something to check. Yeah, yeah. great, Lillian, thank you. I will continue. What about um, uh, here? Then Chi also says, each station was fitted with a velocity type seismograph to collect from data from each station yeah you could do it that way or even just simpler like data was collected from each station and the data were used to create shallow velocity um, simulations just use and data were collected from each station and the data were used to create shallow velocity simulations or you don't even need the data you could say data were collected from each station and used and used to create shallow velocity simulations. And then the last one, so the synthetic data were compared with the observed seismograph data and a shallow velocity model was constructed. Just use and, yeah. So something like that, yeah. Uh, I've got all the colors here. I use these in my classes. This is, this is classroom material that I'm showing you here. I'm always wanting the students to see the subject and the verbs and the modifiers. So that's why I always have colors here. You can see the subject is red, the blue is the verb and the modifier is green. And we can then shrink those two sentences like this. Data were collected from each station and were used, but we don't need the were used. We could actually delete that as well. The synthetic data were compared with the observed seismograph data and a shallow velocity model was constructed. Like that, that's, that's basically how I'm going about teaching titles or methods. I start with some general understanding and then we have some practice exercise focusing on the language. And then for the homework, this is the student's homework, write a draft of your materials and methods sections. List up the steps that you follow in your experiment, add the conditions that you use, add the reasons for the actions that you use and convert each sentence to the correct style, whatever it is for the journal that you want to write in. Is it past, is it passive, is it present? You then decide. So that's how I kind of approach all of these different um, topics. Uh, and I've got some things to remember for the students. Remember to make the materials the subjects and use verbs to explain the actions and use passive voice and, and so on. So I've got some kind of general points here, but ultimately the students would find out from their own journals the best way to write these. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm just looking at the time. We have 20 minutes left and we haven't had questions yet. Q&A yet, and we've still got a few more things to do. Okay. so. Uh, I've been talking about uh, getting the students to do stuff, but what I have not explained at all yet is that, not really explained, is that they're doing these exercises like you just did, but then also they do data-driven learning in the classroom as well. So this would be a kind of example from the titles section that I just showed a few moments ago. We would, I would introduce the titles, they would do some analysis of titles, but then they would have this step one, launch and Kong, Step two, load in the research papers from your field and then answer some questions like which type of title is the most common? So they would then look at their data and decide is it phrase or hanging or sentence? What is the most frequent word in the title? Why? And when you do a word frequency list of titles, you start seeing in and on and for using high up in the list. So they can look at that and then start understanding this. They can also do things like checking meta language, like investigation and study and method. Is that in the title? And the general, the answer is no, because meta language isn't usually used in titles, but they can see that for themselves by doing the analysis. Do titles start with articles or prepositions like a or the or about or in? Again, usually no, and they can find that themselves by doing the analysis. How many phrases can we combine in a title? They can search for that as well. They could search for of and see how many times of appears in a title. What ing verbs are common and so on. Basically, I tried to introduce some questions that they might be interested in and then try to find some of the answers to these. 
Okay, let's move on uh, to another topic which is related. I haven't talked much yet about teaching technical writing online, and I just want to give a couple of points about this before we move on. Um, as I've said already, we do have this idea of peer review that we can do online, but I just want to say some general points here. So we know right now from according to Cisco that 1.2 billion young people have moved to virtual or hybrid education since the start of COVID. So that's a huge number that have moved across into this online environment. And of course, we are in that environment too. And today we're in that environment. So this is my setup. This is, this is what my room <laughs> looks like now. I teach from home. I've got lights all over the place. I've got a green screen behind me, which you can't see. I've got a camera here, a video camera that I used to film myself. I've got a special mic. I've got these special lights to brighten my face so it looks like I don't look like dark. If I turn the lights off, it looks like this. So can I turn it completely off? It's just really dark if I turn them all off. That's my monitor glow here. Then turn them on again. OK. So this is the paradigm that we're working in now. Um, so all of our classes right now for language are taught online at Waseda, all of them in, in science and engineering. It's just crazy right now. They're all on demand or live streamed through Zoom and through Moodle. So what does that mean for us as teachers in this paradigm? So I've got some, I've got a few practical points I think that might be useful for you. So I would say that first, before even trying to create classes, watch some YouTube videos because YouTube people have been teaching online for years, like 10, 15 years now. Go and watch some YouTube, not, not you know, fun videos, <laughs> watch some tutorial videos, like how do people teach cooking or programming or some music theory, like proper, proper instruction, but on YouTube, how do they do it? Look at how this instructor engages with the audience. Look at their eye contact. Do they look at the screen or do they look down? Are they like this all the time? Like, hello, everybody. My name's Lawrence Anthony. Hi. That's not a good way to teach students. You need to look at them. Yeah. So try to look at eye contact. Body language here. Do you want to be doing this? It's too much. In the classroom, this is maybe OK, but on camera, you need to be more still. But then you need to start using your hands a little bit more and maybe change the angle more to introduce body language. See how the, the instructor keeps the audience interested. What do they do to make the audience stay? And you'll see things like scene changes. They'll, they'll swap the camera. They'll cut the camera. They'll zoom in. They'll zoom out. They'll change some of the, the positions to make it interesting. Then try to incorporate these ideas into your own materials. Don't just use slides and an audio script, okay? I'm just gonna come back a second. Look at this. Can you see those? You can see, yeah. You can see um, my camera here. I use two cameras. I also have a camera, where is it, here. So when I film my classes, some of my classes filmed like this, like you now. It's, it's phased like this, and then I move across, and then I swap the camera to over the computer, and then I have an insert of my face into the slide. So we have two completely different shots, like, like this, like big and clear, and then into an insert. So I have a special swapping device, like a, a switcher, a camera switcher. So I can switch from one camera to another. It's crazy, it's like YouTube but I, I switch from one camera to another so I can keep moving, keep the slides moving, keep the, the students listening. So I really think that's important. Set up ways for the students to communicate with you directly as well. So we, also, we always have live sessions. We could, like today, we have Zoom live sessions. We also have messaging systems and chat and forums. Make sure that you are definitely interacting with students. Um, inside of class and outside of class. And as I said earlier, take advantage of these learner management systems, the grading and the tracking systems. Moodle, for example, 
allows you to set up grading rubrics, which are really nice so that you don't have to think about the grading system each time. You go to the uploaded reports, you see the rubric and you can use check boxes to check, is the style good or not? Did they remember articles or not? Is the voice correct? Is the style correct? You know, just go through these different systems. And I've mentioned earlier, the Moodle workshop feature can be used for peer review. So you can do that. Yeah. And I didn't have it written, I, I haven't got it written here, but one thing I think is absolutely crucial for teaching online is being able to say, oh, hi, Lorena, I can see you there. <laughs> That's really important. So I'm talking to you now, but I can see Lorena, I can see Clive is sitting there in his black shirt. <laughs> he just waved at me, thank you. I can see Wendy there. I can see you. I can see you in my class. And that's really important. Even though I'm sharing my screen, I can look across and I can see you all. I can ask questions. And because Lorena and Clive are on video, it's easier for me to ask them questions. I can see them nodding and understanding. So I have the students have their video on. I can see them through the whole class. And then I can ask them questions. I can see them being confused or not sure, and they can speak to me more easily. I think that's a really important aspect for doing this teaching online. One more thing which is not written is that because we're using slides, you have to have good slides that show everything without needing voice. So as you'll have noticed, I've got lots of color like highlighting all the subjects and the verbs and the nouns and so on. And I think that design is really important so that I don't have to keep pointing at everything in the slide for people to understand what I'm saying. So think about a few of those ideas. Okay, now looking at the time, it's, it's 10 minutes to the end and we haven't done like a couple of the really cool things I wanted to do. Oh. It's so annoying, I, I can't do them. Ah, but um, I will, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop the session a little bit earlier. I will tell you what we were going to do so that you can imagine how great the last sessions were gonna be. <laughs> but, um, what I was going to ask you to do later, and I do recommend you do it. Um, first, in the machine translation task, definitely look at this later, okay? I have here a, a, the topic of translation. I've got here two abstracts and the task was, in, it was gonna be in groups and um, I was gonna ask you all to look at these two abstracts and decide which one is written by a student and which one is translated from a Japanese research paper. I don't know if you can see that right there. One of them is perfect and the other is junk. Well, not junk, that's rude. It's not well written at all. And can you guess which one's the Google Translate? The perfect one. The perfect one, yep. It's shockingly good. The first abstract here is machine translation 100%, not one edit on this. I took the Japanese paper, put it into Google Translate, that's what comes out. It is perfect. And it's Japanese, which is the, one of the worst languages for machine translation. Chinese and Japanese is really bad. And that's how bad it is. It's perfect. Students are nowhere near as good as that. They're not even close to that level, which means this question at the top, how do you deal with machine translation in, in the classroom? And what approaches should you or could you try? I really want you to think about this because writing has fundamentally changed. Do we even need writing classes anymore? I'll, I'll tell you just briefly what my answer to this question is, is I embrace translation 100%. I tell my students, if you wanna use translation, fine, just use it, I don't care. But tell me that you're using it. You've gotta tell me, but you will not lose points at all for translation. The reason is, the reason is this great abstract is great because the, 
the structure was good, the content was good, the style was right, it was originally written well. Oh, plagiarism, if, if translated, can turn it in, pick it up. Yes, it can, it can, it can. But I'm not talking about plagiarism here. I'm talking about the student writing in their native language and then translating it into English. So it's a little bit different. I mean, plagiarism is another problem. It, that's about paraphrasing and, and citing correctly. But this is the problem of just literally, they could write in Japanese or write in Chinese and then just translate it. And it's perfect. So why do they need to learn English? So that's the first task and it's something to think about, but my approach, which is has some problems, is basically, I don't care about machine translation, just go with it. Okay, the next task, which is, wasn't going to be, it, this is designed to be done later, is to follow these steps and try and create your own custom corpus. Okay, I was going to not do this live. I was, um, but you saw me do it already and I didn't want to repeat this, but later you can, um, you can go and follow task A to use ant file converter to create your own corpus of student papers or research papers. And then task B is how to go step by step and create a discipline specific, very high quality corpus using ant core gen. And it's really just a few steps. And I think everybody here should be able to do that. It's really just seven steps and then load it into and conk and generate a word list. So have a go with that later. Definitely try it. Don't give up on corpus tools just because it looks difficult initially. Okay. The, the one thing that I really did want to do, which we haven't had chance to do, unfortunately, is to analyze some results. I, I had the bio, biochemistry papers in the, in the task. I wanted you to load in these biochemistry research papers, analyze them with AntConc a little bit, just a little bit. I've got some questions here to look at, like, should you use figure or fig? Um, is data singular or plural? We actually had that question today. Do we use cell activation or cells activation? Things like that. But then it was, it was to go from that task into the final task, which was to Take, take this paper. I'll just show you here just quickly. You can all see that, yeah. So this is, this is a result about Google Translate. It's what we're talking about now, about the high quality of Google Translate. There's a discussion of the results. It's a figure res result explanation. And the task was for you to think, based on what you found out from the analysis of the data, and then based on this example, how would you go about teaching it? How would you teach report writing or results, figure explanation writing based on this sample? So please go away and definitely think about it. I've actually got the answer, kind of my way of teaching the results figure section uh, writing. And I'll leave that in the slides um, so you can look later. But definitely think of today about what we've been talking about, about the, the basic structure, and then focusing on the language like tense and voice. And not don't worry about the content. Think about noun phrases and replacing them with A and B and C and so on. And think how you would present that to students. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, and we do have, instead of 15 minutes of questions, we have like four minutes of questions, but maybe we can, I can stay around a little bit longer. So I will stop there. And um, sorry to have to rush that last part. Um, I would have liked to have gone through those tasks a little bit more in detail, but that's the way it goes. Thank you, everybody. That's great. Well, while people are thinking of questions of um, I want to say a few things uh, in two minutes. Okay, so thank you really, really so much, uh, Professor um, Lawrence Anthony. I think you would all agree with me that we have had a very intensive but very insightful, uh, informative session with uh, Lawrence. And no matter whether you're teaching undergraduate or postgraduate students, I think you got really some ideas in, uh, in your teaching of disciplinary um, specific 
um, writing classes, right? And so um, we have recorded the session and we will share the, um, the video in the um, hub. Uh, let me show it to you. In the hub um, resource session, okay, mm -hmm. which is here. I'll go back to that. Okay, so um, so in this session, there are actually more materials than. Um, so here oh, yeah. you can see, yeah, okay, of all actually all the past sessions with the materials and presentation videos. So um, you got to be a member so that uh, we have, you know, because we have a lot of videos here, including our own colleagues. Okay, and other materials here. But I also want to promote um, next week's session, okay, which is next Friday morning on um, presentation courses for the disciplines. So that would be also very interesting if you haven't um, registered, please do so. Okay, so this is our hub website. Uh, I believe that a lot of you have seen it. We also have one more session next Tuesday on post-COVID classrooms. So please mm -hmm. also welcome to join us. Okay, so are there other questions here in the chat room? Or I see a lot please? of people saying thank you. <laughs> thank you everybody for staying around. That's really yeah. nice for the, the kind comments. Um, that's really nice. Thank you. Oh. I also want to say that, in fact, just now, uh, Chi, uh, Chi is here. Um, she um, you tested me and said, in fact, it was great to see you demonstrating uh, the program yourself because she was trying to look at the, um, you know, the menus online and found it really much better. I said because we have you personal, uh, personally doing it in front of us, mm. so that was yeah. very helpful. Mm. Uh, if uh, if you're interested in the software, I do have quite a few tutorial videos for for Anconc, and um, I think there's a video for Proton, and um, and yeah, and Koji may have one as well. So, but they they also has help pages there as well that you can you can just go through, and it's all like step one, step two, step three. Definitely try out these tools. Um, if you've not done any of these this kind of corpus work before, I know it can be quite in, intimidating initially, but I, as I said right at the beginning, um, because we don't know the fields, right, because we're not in those fields, it's really difficult initially to kind of know what to contribute. Oh, yeah, we know the language, but do we really know the language? Yeah, it's a bit shaky. But if you have a corpus of the student's target field writing, what the students want to write, and it could be emails. I've done the same thing with email writing and um, business, le you know, business letters, emails. If you have a, a, a target set of data, then you are in, in control because you can analyze this, you can understand this, then you can give insights to the students that nobody knows, nobody in the field knows. They pro their professors have no idea if active voice or passive voice is correct. They will just say to the students, you should write in passive voice and it's rubbish. They have no idea often because you have the whole data set and you can look and analyze it. It gives you power in the classroom. It gives you confidence in the classroom that I think you know, some of us don't have because we're, we're like, we don't know the field well. Uh, somebody in the comments, you know, in the, in the survey said, how do you fake it until you can make it? You know, if you go in knowing what you know, knowing the bits that you know, and then you don't have to fake it at all. I tell my students, I don't know architecture. I don't know civil engineering. I don't know these fields. What I do know is I know how I can help them become way better. I know that. And they do get better if they follow these methods. And they understand that. And I think um, it's good if you can try and get that perspective going into the classroom. And I, I did focus a lot on research papers today and like almost all about research papers, but it's, it's, it's a model, <laughs> remember that. Don't think that's all you can use this for. It's one example. It could be with emails or, or any other kind of writing that you might want to do. Even essay writing, you could even do that. Get in, get in samples of like A plus level essays from previous years, from students in previous years, analyze what they wrote and present it to the students. And you, you can go far, I think. Oh, thank you, Mabel. That's a nice comment. Yeah, authenticity, yeah, be true. What, what do you know? What do they know? And put it together. They know a lot 
they know a lot, especially they know what they don't know, right? They know, sorry, they know what they want to know. They want to know how to do this. They want to know how to do that. And it, by, by them telling you and what they want to know, that's a great start to then helping them get there. So hmm, thank you. And Martin, thank you for that comment. Uh, hmm. Many more. <laughs> yeah, I can see. Does anybody have any direct question? Can I ask a question? Yeah, Sissy, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for this very, very insightful talk. I enjoyed it very much. Um, we we sometimes teach visual arts students, you know, history, you know. Yeah. Their, their papers are so different and they're put in the yeah. same class. And uh, yeah, we, we use our method as well and get them to analyze their own discipline yeah. journals that they're targeting at. Uh, but, you know, they have difficulties analyzing their own um disciplinary uh, you know, yeah. publications so mm. do you have any advice so because first uh, the comment that Sissy made you know so different yeah I, I i completely understand so i i in we have i teach 17 disciplines they're all in science and engineering but one of those is architecture and if you know anything about architecture it's very artsy it's like historical stuff. Oh, it's very unscientific in many, many ways. I also teach mathematics students and mathematics is not science writing at all. It's completely different. And I have the same issue with a sissy. Like what do we kind of teach them in the class? Like these models that I'm presenting today don't work for many of these fields. And so what I, I really tried to focus in the classroom, I, I, I mentioned like every time. So, um, so in, in um, architecture though, you're gonna find something completely different. <laughs> so, you know, have a look and see how different your field is to what we've been talking about in the class as a whole. I say to the mathematics students, have a look at the style in your field because you, you might find it's quite different. So how are the verbs used in your field? So the answer to Sissy's question is, be aware that there is a difference and then like try to know where the differences are going to be. So they're, if they're in terms of sentence length or verb usage or the, the use of personal pronouns, for example, or the use of longer, like, um, more complicated grammatical structures or maybe just more general language, know that. Don't, you don't have to know how they're doing it, but know what features of language they need to look at. And then you can tell them quite, quite specifically, you can say to them, okay, now when you're looking at the introduction, okay, first check, check on the length. That's a really simple thing to check on, right? The length. How long is it? And you'll see that in the our class, we've been looking at 200 word introductions, but this is 2000 words. Okay, it's so different. Why is it different? What is the structure of the introduction? What are they talking about in the first paragraph, the second paragraph, and so on? I would do things like focus on the topic sentence. What is the topic sentence of each paragraph? Ask them, you know, to check the, the topic sentence. What is the topic of each sentence? How does it connect together? what is the overall logical structure and all these are very very general questions right i'm not and if you ask them they can then see the answers to those questions uh, they may say for example oh it's chronological it's it's just you know a date or a time period this paragraph's about this time this paragraph's about this time and it's all written in simple past tense great because science is not like that so science writing is not chronological at all it's situation problem response evaluation and that kind of thing great question sissy yeah can i just uh, add one more thing uh, sometimes i feel you know i i'm i'm not giving the same kind of a support i give to math students and visual arts students because because there is much more research of, yeah, you know this RID yeah. format. You know, yeah, that's so right. So much about you know genre features, you know lexical grammatical features, whereas there's much less research on other types of um, you know. Uh, yeah, what what I it's not a great answer to that question, but what I I often tell the students is that there is not a lot of research on this, and everything that you find is really good. It's really new and interesting. So I kind of show them 
that I'm really interested in what they discover about the language. So I kind of give them more kind of, I don't know, persuasive force to like do it. So because their, resu their results will go into my class for the future. I kind of put it that way. So they have more power in the classroom because they they are finding things that I really don't know. And they find that cool, you know, they actually, for my students, they find it really cool that they've discovered something about language which I didn't know. So maybe it's, it's not a great answer, you know, so it's almost like, don't support them, let them support you, but it can be effective, I think. It means the class will still go very nicely because they still feel like they're getting something from the class. Mm. That, is that okay? Okay. Any other points? I really would like to um, hear what people think about machine translation and how they're approaching the problem of machine translation in class. Um, for me, this is one of the most difficult aspects to deal with right now. And I've given up trying to stop them using machine translation. And now I'm really, I'm fully embracing it. And um, the, the problem for me is before it wasn't very good. And I would be able to say, you know, in class, okay, now here's where the machine translation is bad and here's how you can fix it. But it's getting so good that there is no difference from native speakers. It looks like plagiarism because it's perfect. Mm. But, but we, we are language teachers. <laughs> so we have another mission that is to teach them to improve their language. So yes, we, mm. we can, you know, make good use of a Google translation, but uh, yeah. so how do we strike a balance there? <laughs> my, my thinking about this, I, I, I always think about this, but one, one aspect is um, is to turn it into some kind of reading class. It's a writing class. It is a writing class. So you talk about the structure and the format and the tenses and the voice and everything else that I've talked about today. But then the students will go away and use Translate, right? They go away, use Google Translate, come back with their Google Translate. But how do they know it's good? Do they just completely trust that Google Translate has worked properly? If they have this knowledge, they can look at the translation and actually kind of learn from it in some way. They can see, oh yeah, okay, that's good. Oh, but that's funny. That's not what I want to say. And they can look at their own and writing in it with an anal analytical approach, like today, like looking at the titles of other people's, they can look at their own Google Translate title and say, oh, actually, no, I don't want that word there. I want it there and they can edit their own writing. And maybe that's the way to go. It's one way to go. It's one way. But I, I, I can pretty confidently say, if a teacher is going into class and saying, don't use Google Translate, just don't, it's not gonna be useful because the students will. So you've, you can't just deny it. It's just denial. Google doesn't exist, <laughs> it does. They will use it. So yeah, it's, how do you deal with it? It's the question. Mm. Lillian, do we yeah. do you want to keep going a little bit longer, I, or? I are there any other maybe if not question but comment or? Um, I can see Lorena sitting sitting there I'm, smiling I'm the whole I'm, time. <laughs> I'm enjoying this so much. Uh, yeah. <laughs> actually, the only thing I have is actually comment. Just want to say, like, really, thank you, Lawrence. I've learned a lot today. And I, to be honest, I loved your style. Like everything you show us with, the, you know, how you do it, the, the contact, the lights. And uh, yeah, I mean, not many of us are lucky to invest so much in, you know, online classes and doing it the same way. But yeah, really enjoy it. It was so oh, engaging. Oh, thank you so much. I learned a lot. Thank you so much. Oh, that's, that's, that's really good. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you, Lorraine. And thank you for being on video the whole time because oh, no, no, no as, as a teacher you know as, and i hope everybody here appreciates this it's really hard to teach when there's a silence there's everybody's muted everybody's got their videos mm. turned off it can be like talking into the void 
It's so being able scary. to look across, <laughs> yeah, look across and see people, it really helps to not have to keep saying, Do you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you yeah. See? yeah, it's really good. And I also agree with you with the, with the two screens. I've never used them, but I always have these difficulties. Like I, I like to see all my students on the screen. Yeah. So I, I like yeah. to call them by names. So I, I right. find myself like flipping a lot between, you know, this and that. And But yeah, exactly. having, a, having multiple screens definitely helps. So I, as I was saying earlier, I, I have two main screens. So my main, like right now, this screen here, mm -hmm. this is my main screen and we're sharing. And I can see everybody here. But when I want to work, or demonstrate something, I'll move you across. So now you're over here. And now my main screen's here. So I, but I've got to be careful now. I don't want to see looking at the <laughs> here. So I need to look at you guys, but now my main screen is here. So I can use this as a kind of demonstration sharing and so on. But then I have one more screen, which is down here, which I actually use to prepare things to show onto the screen. So I have you, I, you're permanently here. I can see everybody here. This is Lorena's here, Sissy, Lillian. Here's my main screen and here's my preparation screen. So that's how I'm doing it. I'm using three now. I, and I do, find you, that... do you use a computer like laptop or a computer like your, your as the so best? I've got, I think I've, it's a lot of power. I've got it, one main, so I've got two. So I've got my, <laughs> it's kind of cool. I've got my computer is down here. So I use a laptop as my main, so. I use a laptop mm -hmm. connected to a big monitor and another monitor. So I've got, that's why I've got three. So two main monitors and then the computer monitor. You can probably see, wow. oh, maybe there's my computer. That's, that's the one I'm using. Mm -hmm. That's my, that's the computer I'm using for my preparation. Right, we can see. And then, oh, yeah. 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 And then there's one here and then one here. Yeah, I haven't been so fortunate with the background. So I'm always like, because <laughs> it needs a lot of power. So yeah, it yeah, it, you need, yeah, most, most laptops can handle three now without any problem. Most of <laughs> Not them are fine. Not apparently. No, I, I think, I think <laughs> you're yeah, fine. fine. But definitely two, definitely two. Mm -hmm. You definitely need two. D three is maybe too many, but um, definitely two. And the other thing for just a quick advice for um, people in the room is, I'm going to talk about this next week, particularly, but um, it's also the position of the camera. So a lot of people are too low like this because they actually have the camera. If I move my camera, they have it down here on their computer like that. And then they try and look down like this and, they, and it's never kind of right. You know, and they can never get it into the right position. And it's like this. And what um, Lorena and... Um, and many of you have done if, if you've got your camera high so mm -hmm. it's really high up it's my camera is camera. yeah yeah my camera is in line with my eyes and that's really really good so blanche you need to kind of raise your camera raise your camera a little bit okay yeah so blanche it's, is it's now a bit, blanche is like this right now yeah mm -hmm. so you need to kind of get it a bit higher up okay. get your eyes in okay. line with the camera Okay. That that's that's yeah, it's a little bit camera. tricky because my desk is a, is a standing desk, you see. Yeah, but uh, what you need to do then is get books, whatever. Yeah. Just yeah, get yeah. it high, get okay. it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. It's a it's so the camera, and then of course then you got the lights issue as well. So if mm -hmm. I turn, so I've got two two, two lights here, mm -hmm. um, and I can control the colors of these as well. You can see that. Yeah, I got the same. I <laughs> like the same lights. <laughs> uh, the ring lights. Yeah, the I've ring got two light, ring lights. Yeah. yeah, two ring lights yeah. up here. Oh, I oh, you... <laughs> not not even used. <laughs> well, yeah, Lorena, you... not today. I, I, You're professional. I, I got the same one, Lorena. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Kind of... Somebody advised. They said like you really use them. They're good enough. Yeah. You know, wow. Which I'm not using right now. <laughs> Yeah, that's really that's good. Was, yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, exactly you, the same thing. Lorena's like totally pro. <laughs> yeah, but I still need the camera. See, because I'm using the laptop cameras and I don't have a proper PC. So yeah, yeah right. Yeah, laptop cameras are not so good. I'm using a Logitech one here, which is really nice. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're good. They're good. I'm much yeah. brighter now. Now it's changing. Oh, yeah, tongue. that's right. Yeah, you, tongue. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. 
Oh, thank you, Mabel, for that kind comment. Is she here still? Maybe. Go. You're welcome. Thank you, Lawrence. <laughs> Where are you? I can't see you. Oh, there you are with thank your you son. Thank you all Is very your much son? for a lovely time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if you next week we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about this again with the cameras and the lights because we're talking about presentations and of course we'll be focusing mainly on on traditional conference presentations but I will mention uh, about online presentations and some of the things I mentioned just now about the camera position and um, making sure that you're talking to the audience in the camera not down or to the right it's, it's that the early in the morning right the presentation right, it's um uh yes 9 30 yeah. i think um, i'm currently in the uk time. yes i'm currently oh. in the uk oh. so my time is i know it's completely different uh, so yeah today I start with seven o'clock in the morning but i'm afraid i would love to <laughs> uh -huh. attend and i even registered for it but i don't think i can <laughs> my eyes won't be open my brain. yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The uk Sorry time difference is horrible yeah. <laughs> horrible yeah. but really I, i'm really gonna miss uh, your second presentation well we will have the video available again so if you're really interested it's not the same that. life is as much yeah, i know it's not the same <laughs> yeah. it's, i, know. I it's like not the interaction the yeah mm. but i will definitely i will definitely take a look thank you very much uh, oh yeah Lawrence. you're very welcome yes. yeah so, thank you everybody yeah thank you everybody as i said at the very beginning and thank I you was, lillian yeah very thank much you for hosting this yeah, I was so happy to that Lawrence accepted the invitation to <laughs> to come to talk to us. And I have, I mean, communicated with him in the last few months. I've noticed that that he really prepared so well for this. I told uh, Lucas that we have to be really alert and to support him to really, you know, <laughs> make this session really great because he has put so much effort and time into the preparation. Thank you so much. And thank you all the all of you actually uh, staying and participating and interacting and talking, sharing. Yeah. Thank you, so, everybody. And uh, maybe I'll see you. some of you next week. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully we see you live as well. Yes. Oh, yes, Sometimes definitely. So, yeah. Oh, I yeah. hope so. I really hope so. so. Yeah. I really hope so. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Have a lovely evening. Yeah, yes. everybody. Thank See you, you then. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thank, you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you.